Good evening, everyone. Right, we are running. So I'm, I, I know you've got homes to go to, but honestly, there's some really good, really good people to talk about here. But I will I'll try and finish on time. Okay. So volume one, literally, volume one is at the back. Um, it was published in March 2021, and it sold about 1,500 now. It's on its second printing, gradually working its way through, and it's a bargain at £15, <laughs> so yeah, I guess it. The good news is, because it's been so successful, um, we've actually been given the funding by the Hackney Society to do Volume 2. So when we finished that one, 113 women, we thought, oh, you know, we probably, we probably got there. Um, but we carried on researching. When I say we, there's a sort of core of us. So Wendy and Rosie at the back, Lucy, who I don't think is here tonight, and me, we carried on researching. And now we've got about 300 extra. Um, some of them are not going to have enough info to get a book, but there's some really interesting ones, and Stoke Newington has many. Um, so tonight I'm going to sort of talk about some extra information we found about Stoke Newington, some of the Stoke Newington women in Women from Hackney's History 1, which we must learn to call it, and then I'll talk about a few that will make number two. So roughly divided into updates on some of them. And volume two, the new discoveries. So um, I'll give you a few ideas. Um, we've got a Victorian radical politician, somebody that Queen Victoria called very peculiar, <laughs> clever and masculine. Hmm, not sure about that. Um, 19th century writer, spiritualist, teacher of Ada Lovelace, the computer pioneer. Thank you to Rosie for all our hard work on Sophia de Morgan, who we will talk about shortly. Um, we've got a 1920s model, um, fantastic pictures, and a Victorian magician, um, and a diamond thief. So we'll, we'll work our way through and see how far I, how far I get. So to start, one of my favourites. Um, if you had to put a gun to my head, there's a few Ediths in the first volume, Edith Watson particularly, but Edith Garrett is linked to Stoke Newton in many ways. Um, does anybody know who she is? She's the jiu-jitsu suffragette. So a bit, of a bit of a clue there, a bit of a clue there. That's her, well, it, this, this is the one in our gold place near Oxford Circus, um, but she actually had one in Seven Sisters Road too. So she actually had two studios and she trained the suffragettes. She was four foot 11. Um, for whatever reason, she trained in martial arts and she could throw a 13 stone policeman over her shoulder. Um, there are wonderful pictures online, but unfortunately they're copyrighted, so you can look, but I can't put them up there. Um, but she is fantastic, and she has a link to Stokey in that. And when Frida was talking, um, in fact, you know, Fleetwood House has featured quite a lot here. Um, the site of the fire station is the site of 68 Church Street at one point. Um, and she lived at 68 Church Street various times between 1918 and 1931. But now found out, but I'm now a bit confused because after talking to Amir and some Stoke Newington experts, Albion Road's numbering system seems a little bit erratic. Um, in 1902, she's actually at 126 Albion Road. Now this is when her, her daughter Isabel goes to school. So Isabel goes to the Oldfield Road School, which became Daniel Defoe. Um, I'm not sure what it is now, if it, even if it's still a school. Um, but yeah, so we've got an extra, extra Stone Newton address for her. And if 126 is the one I think it is, then it's certainly the right age. And that links me on to, it's a very long story with plaques. We've been trying to get some proper memorials for women. We put in blue plaque applications, they take forever. I mean, for example, I just, I, I just heard today actually from English Heritage about a blue plaque application I put in two years ago, and it's only just got to its first meeting. So they've not even decided that it's going ahead yet. So that's how long, about five years in total. Edith actually does have a plaque in Islington. If you know Thornhill Square, she's got a plaque there. But, you know, if you can find a specific house that's got a strong link, was the same as it was when they lived there, 
then that's ticking the boxes for English heritage. And we hope Edith can get a blue plaque at some stage. I love the frolic culture for children. <laughs> Not quite sure what that is. Um, but anyway, that's what she did as well as teaching jiu-jitsu to suffragettes. So she actually formed the bodyguard of the Pankhursts. They were taught how to fight and how to use Indian clubs and that sort of thing. Because obviously they were attacked. I mean, they were fighting because they were assaulted. Um, yeah, they needed to fight back. And this is a rather lovely photo I found from the British newspaper archive. This is her age 93 in 1965, and she's being interviewed for a woman's magazine, and she's practicing, well, showing, showing the rather hapless interviewer how to do a hand lock or a thumb lock or something. Um, but yeah, fantastic, fantastic woman. Um, yeah, and she has this rather weird sculpture of Finsbury Park Station, which seems to be being used as a bike rack. <laughs> but that is apparently Edith Garrett. And that is there because she had this um, studio in Seven Sisters Road. Anyway, you know, we take memorials where we can get them. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, now Margaret. Some of you, know, well, if you know Abney Park, you know Margaret Graham's got her headstone now. She was an aeronaut, so late Georgian, Victorian, um, hot air balloonist. Um, she died in some, yeah, in some poverty, so she actually ended up in a common grave at Abney Park with no headstone whatsoever. Um, but yeah, she's the first woman to fly solo. And Sharon Wright, who wrote this book, The Lost History of the Lady Aeronauts, which is fantastic, so do get it. And she's actually pointed me in the direction of two other Hackney girls who were uh, aeronauts as well. So they'll probably be in the second book. Um, but yes, so Sarah Wright actually crowdfunded for this actual headstone for Margaret at Abney Park. So that is by the curbside and very easily found now. Um, what we also found, oops, what have I done? An image. I'm not sure I'm the first one to find this, but when I was looking through the British newspaper archive, and it was great fun reading all these newspaper reports about Margaret Graham's exploits because she did crash quite a lot. Um, there's, yeah, stories of her crashing into um, chimney pots on Piccadilly and having to be rescued from the roof and that sort of thing. It's great stuff. But I came across this picture as well. So this was from a Sotheby's sale, um, a drawings of a man called John Hayter, but it's the only image we've actually got of her, and that's her with her husband, George, who was also, also an aeronaut. She died in her bed. So, no accident. Well, she had plenty of accidents, but um, didn't end up that way. But sadly, without a headstone, but now she has one. Excellent. So, that's. Oh, and the women, I have to put a women of Avenue plug. If any of you have not seen the film, Hello Nick, who did all the filming, um, Women of Avenue is on the Hackney Society's YouTube channel. If you haven't seen it, it's an hour long, features lots of women, well, actresses who are playing women who were buried at Avenue Park one of whom is Margaret Graham, and she's played by the wonderful Selena Cadell, and it is fantastic, so please go and watch it. There may be a showing at Abney Park once they reopen the chapel, but for now, you can see it on the YouTube channel. Rebecca. Now, this is a very newly discovered picture. I think, and I wasn't here, but somebody who spoke at the last event was talking about Rebecca Jarrett. And previously, we only had line drawings from her trial. I mean, in, in short, she's, a, she's in the book, so if you need a story, go and, go and buy the book. Um, she basically helped a man called W.T. Stead to ex do a sort of newspaper expose of a very hypocritical Victorian um, um, episode, where basically, she wanted to prove that you could buy young girls off the street to force them into prostitution. Rebecca was a prostitute herself. In former life, she was actually rescued by the Salvation Army and was working for the Salvation Army at the time um, when she got involved in this newspaper sting in the Pall Mall Gazette. Due to a technicality, um, both W.T. Stead um, and Rebecca ended up being imprisoned 
for induction. And this recently came out on the Salvation Army's own website. They're really, really good at digging up really interesting material. And as I say, we only used to have line drawings at best. And I, when I saw this, I was so pleased. She actually looks well and reasonably happy, quite serene. Um, so bits we've also found out about her. Um, I mean, there's going to be, this, uh, um, at, at, she's buried at Abney as well, but way away from the Salvation Army Grandees. She's in her joint grave. Um, it's going to be restored. Salvation Army are paying, I think. Um, and also there's going to be additional signage, because it's not one of those ones that's handily by the curbside and everything. So there's going to be some signage to tell people about what she did, an extraordinarily brave woman. But there's bits some lots sort of coming out. I mean, there's, there was a story that she was actually a laundress at Claridge's. I was very tempted to go to Claridge's and say, can we have a plaque for her? She's a former prostitute. Um, she did a... Oh, they probably wouldn't want to do that. Um, but she was welcomed back from prison at the Congress Hall in Lower Clacton Road. So if anybody know where the portico is on Linscott Road, which is just about to become a doctor's surgery, that is where the Congress Hall for the Salvation Army was, and that's where she came back to. And her funeral was actually held at Florence Booth Hall, which is opposite the town hall, so the old um, women's social work building next to next to the picture house. Um, that's where her funeral was held before she was buried at Abney Park. So they did recognise her. Salvation Army did recognise her greatly. Right, so Rebecca. You probably all know this if this is if you know Abney at all. So this is the grave of Frank and Susanna Bostock, who ran a menagerie circus. Um, in, well, they were based in Stoke Newton. I think they kept giraffes famously in Yokeley Road. Um, but this is a rather fine, fine um, memorial. Um, the interesting thing with this, and we've been trying to find out, because Frank and Susanna had a rather volatile marriage, as we, we discovered. Um, and we were quite intrigued by, I don't know if you can actually see it on there. Let's see if I can get, yeah. Oops, no, probably not. Yeah. So there you have Florence Effie Boys, also buried with the Bostocks. Um, after Frank dies, I mean, at least a decade longer, um, Susanna dies after that and is, joins him under, under the lion. Um, she's basically living with Effie Boys. Um, they seem to be, they're certainly living in the same house. It seems to be a sort of companion, constant companion thing. But um, this friendship actually started way before Frank died because Frank's will actually leaves the third to Susanna while she's still a widow. I mean, that's fairly standard. As soon as they remarried, you lost all your money. Um, but the rest in unequal shares to his children and to Florence Effie Boys. So she gets a share of his money. And actually, her wreath at the funeral is the one that's put on his coffin. So clearly, very close relationship within this family. And the will actually says, in recognition of her many kindnesses and devotion and faithful service to the children. But this all carries on. I mean, she becomes executor to Susanna's will um, when they reform the companies that actually run the menagerie in 1913, she is co-director with Susanna. So we can only find sort of formal, formal records. There's no you know, personal diaries or anything to give us any sort of clue as to quite what role Florence Effie Boys played in the Bostock's life. But we'll, we'll carry on looking because it's, it's intriguing. Anyway, so that's the end of my quick run through some of the extra stuff we found about the women in number one. This, what have I put her? I put her down as Margaret Megan in brackets. She's Welsh, so basically she's sort of partly called Margaret, partly called Megan, depending on which, which publication you find. Now, she's a singer, songwriter, scientist, and philanthropist. 
she's one of those women that you think, oh my God, when did she sleep? I, I really don't know. Anyway, she studied at the Royal Academy of Music, and she's considered one of the great vocalists of her time. I mean, Jenny Lind, who was top, top singer of the time, says, two sisters only have I in the art, Madame Schumann and Megan Watts Hughes. So she was big. Um, reports of her singing, actually, I find this quite funny because my singing renders people unconscious as well, but not for that reason at all. I, I think they're, being, they're doing it it's so good that it renders people unconscious. Um, but she found a boys' home in, if anybody knows Islington and Barnsbury Square, there's a rather lovely house that's still there called Malford House. And she actually ran a orphan boys' school there. Lives in Islington itself, 19 Compton Terrace, and that's where she dies, so near Highbury and Islington Station. And that house is right next to the Union Chapel. I mean, literally next door, and it's got the most beautiful stained glass in it. Possibly something to do with the fact of her scientific. There's loads of these online now. For some time, they thought they'd been lost, but they rediscovered them. Now, she's a scientist, and she actually de um, demonstrates her idophone, as she calls it. And this is something very similar to what Alexander Graham Bell produces. Basically, she's testing the resonance of her voice through a tube and creating these patterns in sand or other material at the other end of this tube. So basically, how, however she sings causes different patterns. So she's experimenting on this. And she's the first woman to actually demonstrate her own invention at the Royal Society in Piccadilly. That's no mean feat. Um, so the fact that she's top of a tree in opera singing, but she's also recognized as a scientist as well. And she calls these her voice figures. She has a very sort of religious take on this, which I think possibly doesn't help her in the scientific world. Um, they're looking for something quite, well, certainly not religious. She thinks it comes, she thinks it comes from God. Um, but some of the images were actually captured and apparently used in the stained glass in this boy's home in Malford House, which doesn't, well, that stained glass doesn't exist anymore. Whether it's been moved somewhere, I'd love to find it. But anyway, she's buried at Abney Park. Um, her gravestone is off the curb side, but it is readable. So when I do walks in future, I will fit in Megan somewhere. But have a look at these pictures online because there's loads of them and they really are beautiful. Right, Sophia. Now, thank you again to Rosie. She's writing her up for the second volume. Um, Sophia de Morgan lived at the Defoe house in Church Street. So if you know where the blue plaque is, end of Defoe Road. We can't quite work out yet whether it's the same house at the time, but it's certainly the same site. And something, I, I went to Karen Lippmann's um, ghost talk um, at the weekend, and she did mention something about a Mr. Morgan saying that she was in a haunted room at the Defoe house. Now, she did have sisters, so I don't know if it's her, but that makes it sound it is the same, same house. But she comes from a very learned family. Her father is William Friend, who was a Unitarian and worshipped at the, the meeting house. But she's got loads of links with other women in our, in our book. So she assisted at Mary Lister's Invalid Asylum on the High Street, one of those big houses um, just near Abney Park's entrance. She campaigned with Elizabeth Fry on prison reform. And she lived really close and knew Anna Letitia Barbold. So that whole intellectual um, mix of women there <laughs> must have been something. Okay. 1821, she tutors Ada Lovelace. So both her husband, William de Morgan, and, sorry, Augustus de Morgan, William's her son. Um, Augustus de Morgan um, and her father both teach Ada Lovelace, and so does so does she. So, found a member of Bedford College, abolitionist, she's a suffragette, no, not suffragette, that's too early, but she signed the 1866 Women's Suffrage Petition, she's an anti-vivisectionist, she's an animal rights campaigner, she's a spiritualist. Yeah, another one that you think, wow. <laughs> anyway, more to come. Anyway, 
Georgina. Now, Georgina is also buried at um, Avenue Park, um, quite easily found from the curbside, so I hope people will, will see her. But this is the first image I've come across of her. It's obviously not a photo or an actual depiction of her, but it's an advert. Now, she is buried at Avenue with her father, Bernardo, who was also a magician. Um, but she seems to have started as a professional magic performer, age six. And she's a magician and a hypnotist. So basically her, her performances, um, first half, your standard magic tricks. Second half, she hypnotizes members of the audience. So anybody volunteering here? I can, there we go. Um, so basically she, she made, you know, these um, rather stuffy Victorian gentlemen um, nurse a baby, for example, and she gets them to eat candles. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but anyway, this is, a, this is an entertainment, an entertainment thing. And her daughter follows in. She's, a, she's basically levitated from the age of four. Interesting. Um, she's remembered mainly because of the rather false story that seems to occasionally raise its head. If you look online about Georgina Eagle, she's basically always linked to this tale of Vicky's ticker. Now, Queen Victoria, obviously devastated when Prince Albert dies, thinks that maybe she can speak to him through a seance. This is a very Victorian, very Victorian thing. Now, where the story falls down is that she is not, she always says she's not a spiritualist, so quite why she's linked to this, I don't know, but there is a, um, a very old-fashioned fog watch that you can see online, which apparently has now gone missing, strangely, um, that seems to link Georgina Eagle to a seance that Queen Victoria had, and Queen Victoria gave her the watch, had it engraved, etc. I'm grateful for that story because it keeps Georgina in the memory. Um, she probably would have faded from it otherwise. She doesn't perform in musicals. I was checking this out when I was doing the Abbey Park walks on the musical stars there. But she does play public halls. There seems to be a very distinct difference. Um, she plays the Stoke Newton Assembly Rooms, for example, in Defoe Road. Um, she plays the Royal Agricultural Hall in Islington, which is now a business design centre. And she plays Shoreditch Town Hall. But she does not play musicals, even though she's occasionally on the, the bill with musical stars. And this we came up, which is quite curious, I have to say. Now, she was married three times, so her names get a bit confused as we go through. So she was married to a Mr. Gilliland, and she was married to a Mr. Card. Um, but she's um, also married to a Mr. Pashley. But... She seems to join the names up and then just use one and then one. So that's another reason she's quite difficult to follow. Um, but the interesting thing is this Abney thing down here. Now, whether it's because her father, Bernardo, is buried at Abney, so they must have known Abney Park, etc. But that is her husband, Mr. Gilliland. I think his name was Arthur, but again, he changes his name quite a lot as well. So his stage name is actually Abney. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, he's a sort of, he seems to be a sort of trick pianist. He is sort of known as a man of many instruments. I think, it is, again, gets quite confused in the sort of res, um, reviews of what they were doing. But they were big. I mean, they had a four year tour of America and Australia in the 1870s, and then they come back and carry on. And she also seems to have almost like residences like they do at Las Vegas. Um, so she did 86 nights in a row in Norwich. <laughs> Which, not quite Las Vegas, is it? But, you know, same, same principle. So, yeah, fascinating woman. And if we ever find a photo of her, I'll be delighted. Right, Harriet Grote, another one I don't think ever slept. Um, 1792 to 1878. Now, listen to this. She was a radical suffragist. Again, she signed the 1866 petition. She spoke at the first suffrage conference in 1869. She's a political strategist. Described as absolutely unconventional, which made me look at her quite closely. Um, she lived in Paradise Place. Um, we were talking about Paradise Place earlier. Um, so the part nearest the church in the 1820s. But she's from a very rich family. When I say that she had a house in town, 
right next to the Bank of England because her family had a bank. Um, Prescott and Grote Bank right next to the, thread, like the Bank of England in Threadneedle Street, and she calls Threadneedle Street Threaders, which I think is quite sweet. And then she moves to Savile Row, where there is a plaque to her husband, George. She's another one who should have a plaque, but he's got it. George Grote was MP for the city and wrote a major, major history of Greece. But when he wrote the history of Greece, she, um, she proofread it, she drew all the maps, and she negotiated the publishing contract. She's definitely the woman behind, behind the throne. So this is a time when women cannot become MPs, cannot become politicians. So basically, she does all the work behind. And there's quite a few quotes that basically say she would be a much, much better MP than her husband. And if she had been a man, she would have been leader of a political party. They don't, oh, and the interesting thing also about her, in terms of elections and everything, between her, George, her husband, and Charles Babbage, the computer pioneer, they devised a secure box to ensure ballot, to ballot secrecy. So you can thank her for the ballot box. So Eileen Hawthorne, when I was at a um, National Portrait Gallery exhibition recently, Madame Yvonne, there was a link, there was, you know, in the little... Um, piece of paper they put beside it to explain what the hell is going on. Eh? Um, this actually said Stone Newton, so obviously my eyes sort of went, Ooh, I will check her out. So Eileen Hawthorne, um, born 139 Shacklewell Lane. Haven't had a chance yet to check that one out. But she's a celebrity of the 1920s, and she, basically she's a really, really good photographic model. She's done lots of advertising. She's basically in the newspapers every day advertising something. Um, but she's got one of those faces that um, look different in every, every photograph. She has an affair with Augustus John, who has a bit of a reputation historically as being rather not nice to women. So we'll leave that one aside. Um, she, it was clear there was some sort of abuse going on. Um, but that is the portrait by him of her Apparently not a very good artist model because she seems to have one of these faces that never, never look the same. So she must have been quite infuriating. Um, she earned lots. I mean, her later, her later addresses are things like Porchester Place and up west and Leinster Gardens in Kensington. But she dies in a house fire. It is really, really sad. The, the actual stories are awful. Um, but she's not even fifty, so. I'm sure there's more to find, but there's some lovely, lovely photos online. And just quickly to finish off, because I don't have any pictures of her, so I'm just going to put up our contact details. But talking about Albion Road and its really awful numbering system, I mean, we were talking about this the other day, there is a diamond thief who was captured by Inspector Witcher at Albion Road, number four, Albion Road. Don't know if it's the New Newington Green end or this end now. Um, number four these days is by Newington Green. But this is 1860, she's age 21. She's nicked 10,000 pounds worth of diamonds from a store in Paris, hooks under a dress. She's walked off with them and she's captured at four Albion Road with her lover, Jack Pierce. Um, yeah, so she's imprisoned twice at Millbank, which is where the Tate Gallery, Old Tate, is now. And when they built, the, the story goes that she hid some of this stash of diamonds when she was imprisoned at Millbank. But sadly, I have to report that both times they've looked, uh, when they built the Tate Gallery after they knocked down the prison, and when there was an archaeological dig in the 70s, they didn't find any. But Emily Lawrence has a link to Stone Newington for that. And that's my last. Right? But there is our email address if you've got any information that you would like to give us about interesting women, not only from Stone Newington, but they have to be from Hackney. Um, pass it on to us, and we'll see if we can get them in book too. Thank you.